This conference will now be recorded. Hi, Terrence O'Hanlon, publisher at Uptime Magazine, executive director at Reliability Leadership Foundation. My great pleasure to be here with my friend and colleague, Mike Brooks at Aspen Tech. Uh, he's written a couple blog pieces that kind of blew my mind recently. So I thought I'd just get him on the, uh, the webinar and we'd have a couple of conversations for this critical path interview. Mike, how you doing? Doing pretty good today, you know, sitting in this little office every day instead of traveling like I used to do. So, you know, we get to climb in the walls occasionally. Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll climb the walls during this interview. So, two, so a couple great, great. I uh, always love it when you uh, get inspired and decide to post something. I love the other writers too, but I, you know, I'm particularly fond of your blog post. And there are two of them that really caught my eye uh, recently. Um, so I want to just ask you about them. You know me, I'm a little, I'm a little uh, negative on the term uh, predictive maintenance. If you follow me at LinkedIn, you know I think that's the business of weathermen and and stock stock brokers, uh, not the business of people who are in asset management. Um, and I really like, you know, you have a different take on it. And and I liked your, I loved your blog about predictive maintenance, especially now that digitalization is bringing us to things like uh, 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 prognostics and diagnostics and prescription. Um, so tell us a little bit about it. What's going on in your, you know, what, what was the blog about? What's predictive maintenance? What's prescriptive maintenance? What's going on in that world? Well, you know, I started with Mtel about eight, nine years ago now, and we got into this. And they were they were maintenance guys. They'd been in in the business for decades and had a lot of experience with what was working well and what wasn't working at all. And basically, we put together something that they often call disruptive innovation. Uh, 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 superficially, it looks fairly simple. It makes claims about it, but what it does, it does so well that eventually it could take over a whole industry. Now, when we looked at this. We looked at the term predictive maintenance, and I'm with you, I didn't like it very much because it was being applied by all kinds of people who weren't doing any predictions at all. And basically, when we did this and we set the technology, it was basic to make sure that we could train based on the actual history of those pieces of equipment to understand what's happening with the patterns of data from the sensors and also from the asset management system to understand the, the behaviors when it's running normally, when it goes into abnormal situations that we don't always don't understand, and also the very specific failure patterns that lead to very specific failures, failure modes and root causes. And we found that those are absolutely precise and exact. So if we've seen it once and measured it once, with very, very surety, we can make sure that we tell you and we predict when it's going to fail and often why it's going to fail. Because when we've seen it before and we've done all the analysis, we understand what the, the, what the issues are, then maybe with 40 days notice on an alert, we can tell you this is precisely what's wrong. And with the assistance of the asset management system, if it's been configured properly, we can tell you a lot of information about what's exactly wrong, what spares are required, how much it's going to cost, and all those things. And this is very different to a company that's, say, doing, you know, lube oil maintenance. And all you need to do is do better with lube oil, change the lube oil more often, and we predict your equipment will run better. I always said there's no prediction in that. We're doing actual machine learning analytics based on pants, the same stuff that they use to drive the, uh, the cars with Tesla and all, basically looking to find those patterns that are going to tell you it's going to happen again, or it's veered from, uh, uh, from normal production. And I think one of the things that we recognize most of all, and this came partly with conversations with ARC and others, is that a lot of these times it couldn't be breaking down and getting damaged is because the process is misbehaving. And that's either because we've taken it's usually we've taken the equipment outside of the design and safety limits and it could be liquid carryover into a compressor it could be as simple as the operator put a set point in wrong but there's often these occasions that cause damage that you can't see or very very difficult to to see for many months and then all of a sudden you get a catastrophic failure so we basically we did jump outside the box to see how could we do this very differently and make a big impact on on, on what was going on that's so that's that's how we got to, and we like to we like to lean a lot more on prescriptive maintenance because that comes from the word prescribe. And I always said, when you tell that operator his machine is going to fail, his first question is going to be, "What do I do?" 
Yeah, exactly. Prescribe like a doctor. The, the, the doctor knows I'm going to die. That's not useful for me. Predict I'm going to die. Yeah, but, but when? And then, yeah, like what can I do about it? Prescribe. Diagnose and prescribe. Those are the words that we like to hear. As I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah, I use, the, I use the doctor metaphor when I give my presentations. Doing our stuff's like going to the doctor. He's not just going to look at the stethoscope. He's going to look at the patient history, understand what happened, what you were prescribed, how you reacted. And we're doing exactly the same with the information from the asset management system and the sensors and the machine sensors. All of those are part of the picture. Well, then you didn't just leave the blog there. You went those patterns. They're going to tell you it's going to talking about asset uh, uh, performance management. 4.0. So you're talking about moving asset performance management, which has been around a while. Now you're moving it forward with digitalization. You use the term interoperability with the other systems in the plant. So I guess start at the top of the mountain. What the heck is asset performance management 4.0? So for, first off, I think one thing I've said for years and years is you cannot separate the process from the machine on the machine from the process. It's not just about looking at the machines. If you really want to look after asset performance management, you have to look at the machine, you have to look at the process around it, and you have, have to look at the other machines that it interacts with. So we believe there's a big process focus in here. After all, the maintenance guys have been the custodians of this for 50 years, but I believe operations must step up and play their part. If we're gonna take you know, maintenance and reliability to the place that it ought to be. So we start with that. We want to understand the process. And if you look at the disturbances that you're likely to get, there's, there's disturbances that are going to lead to mechanical failures. There's also disturbances that lead to quality and yield uh, issues. These are all part of the problem if your machines are not running together. And when I say these applications pull together, this is taking this a step further because now what we're saying, we've got lots of applications that run. I've always said, you know, you can't optimize anything if the asset's not running, if it's broken down. But when, when it is, we want these applications all to be pulling together in the same direction. They can't be separate, isolated applications. So asset performance management has to pull them all together, understanding what you're doing with yield and quality, understanding what you're doing with those sudden uh, changes that you get in the process that the operator can't explain. How does he get to the bottom of that and understand what's going on, whether it's mechanical or whether it's process? And then there's those specific failures, but excuse me, specific degradation patterns that lead to failure. So it's a matter of looking at, at, at all those. And I think APM 4.0 can't be just about the machine. It's got to be how does that machine behave with the process and how does it behave with the other machines? We like to look at this and think we can take care of just the big critical machines. But you know, you can do just as much damage with smaller machines that go down and other machines affect other machines and you can have the same issue. I've worked a lot in oil companies, so I can tell you in a fractionator, if the pump on the top pump around goes down, that's just as almost just as big as the compressor itself going down. So you can't just look at all of them. And we need to be able to blanket the whole process. It was difficult in the past to do this with all kinds of predictive maintenance, condition-based monitoring, because it's difficult and it's hard to do. When we stepped into this, one of the things that before I joined MTEL, I told them, if I come here, we are going to make sure that this works for Joe Normal. He's the regular guy that you've got there with what he knows and right. fits into his work processes. It has to fit for him. We can't be using a, a, a technique that requires intense engineering, statistical, and machine learning data scientists. No, that's not going to be useful. That won't uh, uh, give us the broad coverage that's required to change the industry. So interesting, because a lot of times what you hear when you walk in, we need to know what our most critical asset is. Then we need to cover the heck out of that critical asset with condition monitoring. Then we're saying, and then we'll worry about the rest of the assets. Um, and you're saying, no, wait a second, we got to look at, we got to look at everything involved because at the end of the day, it's a process that we're managing, not that, not just that critical asset. It, it absolutely is. <clears throat> when you look at that one asset, it could be one. And I've asked many companies, can you do a boiler feed water pump? And they'll tell me, no, too expensive. It takes us too much time and effort to do it. But the way that we've applied this technology, we can look at one boiler feed water pump and we can learn everything about that. 
all the patterns of normal behavior, failure behavior. And once we've learned those, you can just drop them onto your own. So you get blanket coverage really, really quickly. And as I said, I think we need to be looking at all this equipment. Not only that, if you do get an issue with one, you want to understand how does it affect the whole system? And what is it that I can do to minimize its impact? Maybe before I shut it down, I've got 40 days notice, <clears throat> excuse me, I can run 20 days, run some material to in, uh, intermediate tankage so that when it does go down, when I take it out, I can actually survive that shutdown a little longer. There's a number of things that you can do there, and we have the tools in place to be able to look and see what is going to be the cost and risk of different actions that you can take when you understand that a, a, a maintenance failure is coming along. And that's one, of course, you know, we look for the things in the process that are going to uh, degrade the equipment. You can't find that with the machine sensors. That's too late. You're looking for root causes. That's very small changes in process that lead to things like pumps cavitating and uh, liquid carryover. These are process effects, and you need to, be, and there really are root cause. And when you look at the rankings of the sensors that lead to failures, right at the very beginning you don't see vibration things like that you see vibration right towards the end just before it's going to fail and we're much more interested in leaning towards the root causes and the process effects that are that are uh, indicating that yeah it's interesting I, I i you know i worked with winston lede a lot who was formerly with dupont he took a thousand corrective work orders and he found that uh 20 of the causes of those correctives was process inputs or the raw material uh, 30% was what you said, operators not following, you know, limits and stuff. 20% was maintenance, um, uh, work, work, uh, uh, workmanship. 10% was the maintenance material was bad, and about 20% uh, was de a bad design, build, or install. So, you know, we often think that in in maintenance and reliability, we're chasing after wear and tear. You're saying, hey, eventually it's, you know, there's some sort of mechanical signal that's going to, you know, right before the breakdown that's going to show up. But there's all kinds of things you should be monitoring in a holistic way if you're looking at the system that are going to be much earlier indicators of a problem, the abnormal operation. Well, that's absolutely correct. And I'll give you an example. We were at a large oil company looking at some big charge pumps. And we basically looked at these and eventually told them the issue was there's a huge change in material density at one point in time. And we could detect the exact pattern where it came from or where it led to. This was a shock to the process engineers. It was a big understanding that they didn't have. They didn't understand that this could cause the problem. And of course, they pushed back a little bit at first and then went to look. And another one was one large oil company told us that there are five bearing failures and they told us they had the same root cause and interesting we looked at those and we said no 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 four have the same root cause this fifth one is different and they said why what's different about it i said i can't tell you what's different but i know it's different because the pattern is very different which tells me something else led to its failure interesting interesting um well what's making 4.0 possible is it the fact that we can now we're censoring everything is it the fact that we can connect everything is it the fact that we have cloud and we can store everything is it the fact that we have machine learning and artificial intelligence and we can analyze everything is it the fact that we you know what, what what's changing what changed with 4.0 that made all this possible well, I think all the things that you've said are part of the solution. They've all led to better ways to, to solve this problem. But I think for us, it was an understanding of, like you said, the holistic nature of all these things affecting asset performance management. It's not just looking at one machine. It's looking at the collective. It's looking at the relationships and behaviors between them. It's about looking about what's happening in the process. And is that affecting what's going on? There's lots of ways where you can lose production, lots of different ways. You didn't schedule properly. Uh, you have breakdowns you don't expect. You have quality and yield uh, uh, issues. So you understand what happened, what you were performance uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, process effective. All manner of things can affect your overall production. And we want to look at all those things together in APM 4.0, not just the maintenance activities. And that's why, and you saw when I drew the maturity py pyramid, I suggested that instead of RCM being at the top, 
the APM 4.0 should be there. Well, and, and so I guess, you know, for, for me and for the audience, though, we have had connected operational data for a long time, plant historians and distributed control systems. So we've had a, a large flow of operational data. Some companies have had a lot of asset condition data, vibration and uh, and you know temperature and voltages and currents and 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 other condition based data. What is making this 4.0 different? Well, why is it different? We've connected operational and asset condition data before. What's making it different? As I said, part of it is the understanding of the holistic nature. The other one is the analytical techniques are far superior. We've moved way on with machine learning techniques from what the old rules-based uh, mechanisms we used to use. So the old flashing of the old flashing alarm. Yeah, and we, one of the things, one of the things, once you start looking at all those uh, sensors, you find that it's never the one alarm, you know, the one sensor that leads to a threshold that tells you. That might tell you, but it'll tell you too late. There's all, always minuscule patterns between these sensors, and these are multidimensional. You know, we're looking at a pump with 50 sensors, you're talking to 51 dimensions. Humans only see three, or well, four a little bit. But if, you, if something happens and you don't see the result within seconds, you've lost it. So these are minuscule changes that humans can't see, but over those multiple dimensions, these new techniques, analytical techniques, can can basically uh, uh, understand those and understand the patterns that are leading and where they're leading to. And I said that with an understanding that we ought to be looking more holistically about all the equipment and the relationship between the equipment. I think that's led us to what uh, what, what would we believe is central to uh, APM 4.0. Very interesting. So what's the challenge to get started? And then how do you get over the, the challenge? Is it is it just a money issue? Can I just send you a, a briefcase full of money and now I'm on Asset Performance Management 4.0? Yes, that would be lovely. No, seriously though, um, we get a lot of questions about the data. Of course, what's happened now is it's a data-driven solution. And if you don't have the data, you can't have a solution. The great thing about what we're doing is that Basically, it's based on pattern recognition. And it's not just about, you know, the stuff that spins, the big stuff that spins fast. It's about all the equipment, whether it's static, whether it's mobile, even process equipment. If you can register the patterns that tell you it's running normally, and you can see and recognize the patterns that tell you it's going towards failure, then we can do it. Uh, we, we basically proclaim any asset, any industry, any failure mode, because if the data are there, you can do it. Now, we get asked a lot about the data, and, for, and I give a simple example of a pump where we did work there were only four sensors. There were as a pressure in, pressure out, fluid temperature, and motor amps. Big slurry pumps they were. And just using those five, four sensors, we gave them two weeks notice that the motor was going to burn up. And of course, they ignored it. And then two weeks later, it actually did burn up. Now, that says we can do a lot with a little. We usually say we want at least five sensors per piece of equipment. But where there's many more sensors, like it may be on a large compressor where you may have 200, uh, or, or those charge pumps where we had 50 sensors, we were able to give four months notice that the, the failure was coming. So we can do a lot with a little, but with, with better and higher quality sensors, we can actually uh, improve the uh, detection periods. Terrific. So it's really it's a it's really a matter of data. Um, and if you have if you have it, then you can put it to use. Um, and, and that's the deal. And if you don't have it, if that, that, that four sensor example, they have a choice. They could sensor out the pump uh, and get additional sensors, correct? That's correct. That's correct. And yeah, of course, that's becoming more prevalent now with the advent of wireless sensors that are much easier and cheaper to install than previously wide sensors. Yeah, making a big difference. Excellent. Well, we're starting to get the picture. That's that's great, Mike. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing um, is ESG, Environment, Sustainability, and Governance. Um, you know, and I know you work with a lot of companies that have uh, environmental concerns and uh, and sustainability concerns. Uh, what is is ASP? I'll give you an opportunity here to uh, to 
show how Aspen Tech is making the world a better place for all of us. How does Aspen Tech, uh, you know, deal with sustainability for its clients or itself? You know, what, what, you know, what's Aspen Tech doing to make the planet a better place? We're getting a lot of young, you know, we're going to have to, you and I pretty soon are going to have to turn the keys over to the kingdom. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so the, the the group that's coming up underneath us, they're a little, they're they've got different concerns than we did. You and I were always after the the almighty dollar, and uh, you know, they're the, these younger folks are. They have, they do, they're looking to make a living too, but they they want a different planet. Um, so what's yeah. Aspen Tech doing to make the world a better place? They're asking us to tell about the companies that we're dealing with, how they make the world a better place. So this is your opportunity to tell them what Aspen Tech does to make the world a better place. So, so we, we can start with APM 4.0, right? And APM 4.0 must, for the equipment and the, uh, and the assets, the unit operations, must plan it right, operate it right, maintain it right, and manage the, the risk and cost of any decisions that you're gonna make in those activities. It starts uh, from there. Now, one thing that we do know and we recognize with our implementations is that if you get an unplanned shutdown, that's absolutely the worst time. That's when you get all those lighter hydrocarbons go to the flare and the flare's going off. That's when you're going to be rushing around trying to make the right decisions with very little time to do it. That's when you're going to put your, your personnel at risk for accidents and the like. That's when you put your plant at risk for leakage and, and, and things like that. So, Having a situation where you can understand precisely when something's li likely to fail and then having the time to plan it properly, then you're going to be in a much better position. When you're going to plan a shutdown, you're going to do it right so you don't get that leakage to flare and you don't go get those massive process interruptions. And you are going to plan and you're going to make sure that people are in the right place, protected appropriately, and they're making the right decisions because you've been through the plan and then you're going to execute the plan. So we believe that we have a strong uh, uh, alignment with those ESG in initiatives. You know, the other thing that, you know, we look to do in, in that is also the compliance part of that. You know, you must be able to plan these things appropriately and execute appropriately if you're not going to break those uh, issues. Wow, that is terrific. Well, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Where can people find out more? What's the website address? It's aspentech.com. Terrific. Great blog up there. Um, uh, there's other writers also. I particularly like your stuff, but uh, there's other good writers up there as well, always contributing. Thanks for the time today. We'll get you back up here. Uh, and uh, again, thanks for sharing your perspective with us, Mike. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it.